자, 다음으로 상생문화연구원의 개건연구원이고 러시아 부리아트 공화국의 관광정보센터의 센터장을 맡고 계신 아야노프 칭기스 박사님을 모시고 Cultural, Archaeological and Genetic Ties of the Ancient Peoples of the Baikal Region with the Population of Korean Peninsula 이런 제목으로 말씀을 듣겠습니다. 자, 감사 부탁드리겠습니다. 알았어요. 아, good morning, dear friends and the audience of this conference. My name is Chingisi. Chingisi. I came from uh, Russia. Russia, salam imida. Puriati. Yeah, and uh, I working as a historian, and also we created the tourist information center, and I'm working there. For a long time. Also, it was a big privilege to be here. And uh, five years ago, uh, the delegation from the uh, institute they came to the Baikal region, and they have some um, excavations, have some um, like uh, research in our area. And I would like to share my presentation about the um, historical, archaeological, um, how would say, connection. Between our region and your region, as far as it is, but it's uh, really close and really cultural, as I said, archaeological and genetic. Because, as you know, the genetic is uh, Asian people, especially Mongol Buryat uh, tribe, they close to the um, Korean uh, genetic. And this is a map of Russia, and usually, as you imagine, uh, Russia is mostly like uh, Russian people. Because Russian people consist of many, many other regions, and the, most of the Russians they look like uh, Caucasian people, the white people, the blonde hair. But you should see that a big part of the map is uh, different colors. It's a different uh, um, linguistic groups and different nations. And you can see the orange one. Here we go. It's a uh, people from the Mongolic language. It is really close to the Altai group. Also, this one is a Turkey Turk group, and this one is a uh, uh, Hakas and different nation. This you go here is Vladivostok. Here is the Japan comes and um, Korea is right here. Okay, which means you can see that it's uh, thousand and thousand peoples. They are uh, different from the classical Russians. They look like more like Asian people, like Asian people. Okay. As I said, the huge number of the people they for long times, for ancient times, they look more oriented to the China, to the Beijing, because as I said, the Beijing and Chinese area was more like a center, and they pulsing and to our very cold uh, region came just an echo of this pulse. And this uh, very interesting uh, story about I uh, should then say the name, and you need to remember it, and please memorize it. I would like to say about Gustav Jon Ramstedt. Gustav Jon Ramstedt. Have you heard about this name, somebody? Of you? It's very important. Please, if I will not remember anything from my speech, but please remember this name, Gustav Jon Ramstedt. It was a very famous uh, uh, Russian and then Finnish uh, scientist, he was a, a linguistic uh, researcher, and he worked for the Russian government in Mongolia, in Tibet, and then he studied many languages, at least 10 languages he studied, and he speak, spoke at five very well. And uh, Gustav Jurmstedt, he uh, fundamental, fundamental books about Altaic linguistic. And he studied about Ural, uh, mm, how to say, uh, Altaic and uh, Ugric, the group of family. And he joined to this big group, the uh, Korean, this yellow one, yellow, and the Japanese language. This man, Gustav Jon Ramstedt, he joined as a one group, and he said it was one exactly root. And he reconstructed a lot of work. He uh, reconstructed Turkish-Mongolian route, and he said all it came probably from this area, from this area. All this, what you can see, almost all over the Asia, 
It came from one root. Of course, during the many, many of ages, it changes a lot. It changes uh, characters, uh, pronunciation, and so many different. But you should know that the changes in language come so quickly. I can uh, say the uh, very simple example. I was born in Soviet Union in Uzbekistan. And everybody of us can speak Russian, and uh, all Uzbek people can speak a little bit in Russian language. Uh, Tajikistan, they, all of them can speak at least some Russian. But when I came yesterday to this area, it's now this empire is ruined, and the, it started to shrink the uh, influence of the Russian language. And many of the young people, though they can't speak Russian at all. They can't speak Russian, they speak in their own language. Which means the changes in the linguistic sphere is coming so quickly, so quickly. It's just one generation past, 200 years left that Russia occupied these territories, uh, Tsar Russia. It was something 19th century, right? The 20th century was Soviet Union, the rise up the language, and now it's in three times less people can speak the Russian language. Which means, please remember this name, Gustav Jon Remstad. When the Finland started to be independent, he started to be ambassador in uh, Japan. Also, he visited Korea and he made a lot of books about the grammar of the Korean language and the Altaic language. It's very important. For the future researches, you need to know that many, many people studied much more before, okay? The next man is a very, I would like to say, I'm really proud of this man. His name was uh, Bichurin. It was a Russian man. He was born in the central part of Russia. And uh, he studied in St. Petersburg as a, like a monk, you know, a Russian Christian Orthodox monk. And he was sent to the Beijing as a missionary, Russian Orthodox missionary. And he not really cared about the Christianity, about mission, but he really started to interest about ancient uh, chronicles, about ancient books. And this Yakin, by the way, it's a name uh, which given as a monk. And really his name is Nikita. Nikita, but Bibichurin. And he studied a lot. He, he studied a lot of uh, ancient uh, uh, mm, Chinese, Korean, and the Chinese chronicle about uh, nations around the uh, Yellow Empire. This is his main uh, book, what was written in Russian, and when he came back to Russia, he started to be a big fan of the Asian lifestyle. You know, um, for Russian it's very important, the Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, it's most famous writer and uh, like a very important in Russian literature, everybody knows him, and he was a really good friend of the Pushkin, and he even invited him to the China, and he need to, you need to see the Asian part of Russia. And this book is still about the ancient uh, tribe called Dunhu, Dunhu, Shunnu, Shunnu, you know? He write a lot about this. Next one I would like to say, because in Russian tradition we're saying uh, about the people who studied this question before. It's very important to know bibliography, who studied this issue before. And this very important man, his name Alexei Akladnikov. Alexei Akladnikov, he's, he was an uh, archaeologist and he excavated the Malta and Buret. It's very important. It's, they found the pale Paleology and uh, Neolithic period in the Siberia, and he found a lot of similarity with the Tungusic Manjurian tribes and the uh, Buryat tribes, um, sorry, ancient Siberian tribes. Alexei Akladnikov. Alexei Akladnikov. And also, a uh, big uh, information we can take from the petroglyphs, petroglyphs in our area. Petroglyphs means, Petros means uh, stone, and glyph is like a characters like uh, imagine on the character. You can see here the uh, classical uh, image, and this is a, uh, uh, like a symbol of the uh, birds, and also in the very top, right here, you can see kind of moose, you know, the moose. It's uh, very often you can see in the near the Baikal Lake, and also this very close, uh, very same, you ca I can see in your National Museum 
in your national museum. Next one is a like a symbols of the men. You can see the horns. Probably it's a maybe shaman, shaman people, and a lot of them is situated uh, near Baikal Lake. It was made uh, more than 10,000 years ago. Next one is the map of the culture of the graves. This is where I'm living, the Baikal Lake. And this area is now modern Mongolia, the Manchuria, and the um, northern China. This place where is a lot of graves we found it. A lot of graves we found. And this is how it looked like, tiled graves. It's, you can see easy in a step the big stones, and I excavated some of them. Not me, I was not a chief. I was uh, like a member of these expeditions, and we found uh, a, a lot of them. I have uh, this is in museum. You can see one type. It's uh, these tile graves, and in the background here, you can see the, we call this kereksur. Kereksur is uh, like a, also um, uh, artifact. We can find a lot in our area. In this, uh, uh, how to say, graves is uh, idea that we visited with your uh, expedition this territory. Uh, this is how they look like from this uh, tile grave, uh, graves. And mostly they look like, like a modern people of the Buryat region. They uh, look like more like uh, Asian type of people. And uh, it was uh, rebuilt by the famous Russian uh, sculptor Gerasimov. Gerasimov in the St. Petersburg. Next one, the Kereksu culture looks like a bit, little bit differently because uh, the, the graves is more like Asian people. The Kereksu people, they more like a uh, European way uh, uh, face. The white people, we can say, Caucasian, Caucasian. And you can see the similarity from Kereksu culture with the, your culture, especially in ceramic, in uh, some um, ring bells and also in daggers, in daggers. And you probably, I have seen that you have a special report about the Korean daggers and you, how you're studying and so many similarity, but maybe it comes the same in all over the world, all over the world. Next one, this uh, territory for next uh, uh, step, it's uh, also came this information from the Akin Bichurin uh, books. He said it's in the very center here. It's a nation called Din Lin, Din Lin from the west, UH, UH, and Shunnu. And here is a tribe called Dunghu, Dunghu. And we believe, I believe strongly that uh, Dunghu and Shunnu was quite close to each other. And they speak its proto-Mongolian language. But of course, it's uh, under the, um, we can discuss about it because some people thinking that uh, Shunnu language has disappeared, it's now not exist anymore. Some people really believe that it's a, a Turkish language, like a pro-Turkish, it's the strongest idea. But as for me, because I'm part of the Mongolian world and I'm living there, I believe that Dunghu and Shunnu, they was like a pre-ancestor for the modern uh, Mongolian tribe, Mongolian and the Burya tribe, of course. And here you can see a lot of uh, similarity. And as I say, Akin Bichurin, he studied ancient uh, Chinese chronicles, which some of them was disappeared, and he bring to the uh, Russian Empire uh, Science Court, he bring a lot of uh, the originals, and he said that it was the Proto-Mongolian tribe. As I said, Dinling, UH, UH is more like uh, Indo-Persian tribe, Shunnu and Dunhu. Then this was moved to the west. And uh, uh, last three years we excavated near Ulanude a big uh, graves, uh, big grave. It's uh, called uh, Ilmavapat, Ilmavapat, and we found a lot of interesting material here. And here I can see, I can show you the similarity with the uh, Korean uh, um, decoration. Because here you can see how the, uh, the same uh, suggests changes in many uh, cultures. Because the first one came from the western part of the Greece, 
And you can see there's a lot of time, a lot of uh, material. And in our territory, this changes year by year. It's going to more and more simple one. You can see this uh, tree and this uh, like uh, um, gods comes to more geometrical uh, figures. And you can see how it changes. And finally, number five, we have a lot in our territory. This, see, this started to be very, very simple. Like uh, animals, holy tree, and the running around is, uh, represents the fertility. The idea of this symbol is fertility. The next one, it's uh, in our region called Diristui. Diristui, you can see the, uh, how the hunting for the boar and how it changes the difference. And also, next one, you can see uh, the uh, idea, the plot of uh, four snakes. See, number one is coming. The snakes is uh, like uh, mixing with each other. And now it's going uh, to be more and more, more and simple. And I have seen in your museum also very same this uh, subject. I don't know where it came from. But we can find a lot in our territory. These uh, snakes is sneaking around, and you can see the transformation of sujet. The next one is uh, came. Uh, These uh, bucklets came from the uh, horse harness. In the very beginning, you can see this uh, very complicated. You can see when the horse heads and the hoofs, and then it's going more and more and more simple. Why? Because you can see this in our life, the utility stuff going from the uh, complicated form to more simple one. Also, this, uh, like, uh, bucklets, and you can see this, uh, um, how to say, decoration, for, it's a birds, birds coming from, like, uh, in a line, staying in line. Then it's going more and more simple, and finally, we can see this very simple subject. And I saw in the uh, Seoul National Museum very same subject also. Also, this, uh, this bucket for the belt, and you can see uh, in, from number one to number eight, the changes, how it's transformed to more and more simple. And nine to 12, it's a, a subject or idea about the bear, the comb, comb, okay? is how it looked like home and more and more simple and now you can see here but the, uh, this idea it came from the uh, number nine okay because for us and for the Shunu people the bear was a sacred and holy animal holy animal okay also it's a big uh, also links with the uh, Middle East and you can see this uh, came from the Middle East, even maybe from Iran, I don't know exactly. This idea this, uh, of the also fertility, this see this two oxes, this man sitting on the back of the ox, and this uh, water, two big cats, and this uh, also cat and some uh, uh, bird attacking the uh, ox. And uh, you can see in our territory the same subject. See, this is a... Uh, very popular in uh, graves of the uh, Shunnu culture. If you see, here is a, from the um, Hafaya, it's also in Iran. And you can see there's the same subject in, um, uh, how to say, in uh, Shunnu tribes. It's a mistake, it's not from Greece, it's from the Iran. And uh, final uh, plots, it's a, see there's uh, two oxes, and also this one, I even hold it in my hands. This uh, oxes, but uh, you should know that uh, many people saying that uh, uh, Shunu people was like a barbarian, and the Chinese explaining them as a barbarian, wild people. But in really, you can see this uh, oxes, which means it was probably some uh, house agricultural, they were very um, cultural people. And uh, many ideas and um, plots they take from the um, western part uh, of the world. Probably it was a big uh, trade gates. And finally, this how what I'm believing, uh, that uh, this uh, grave culture 
It came here, but Dunhu people, Dunhu people, which is belonging to the Mongolian tribe, <coughs> I believe in that it's joining to somehow to the Korean Peninsula uh, through these ideas. And finally, this what we excavated in, and next uh, next uh, summer, next summer, we will uh, make another uh, how to say expeditions, expeditions, and because you know in Siberia. It's uh, a lot, a lot of uh, place and field to, for researching, in really. And I hope that uh, next time I will give you in my, uh, how to say, my article, more information about this topic. And uh, I'm really thankful that you invited me. And thank you very much for your attention. Kamsamnida. <laughs>